Thank you, Dr. Yanish. I've, I've absorbed a lot of science through osmosis. I think uh, my 10th grade biology teacher would be surprised at what I do. The, um, the next speaker uh, represents something new for our summit. Uh, generally, when uh, the general population thinks about stem cells or regenerative medicine in the federal government, we think about the National Institutes of Health. But there is robust investment in this field by the Department of Defense, the U.S. military, and specifically the U.S. Army. Uh, later on tomorrow, there will be a session um, uh, where we have the, a representative, uh, Terry Ergens, who's the head of the Armed Forces Institute for, for Regenerative Medicine, to address this robust investment. Uh, right now, I'm very honored to introduce as our next keynote speaker, Commander James K. Gilman, MD. Major General uh, Gilman uh, is the Commanding General of the U.S. Army Medical Research and Material Command at Fort Detrick, Maryland. General Gilman. Well, good morning. Wow. Or as uh, we say it in the Army, hua. Um, I want to thank uh, Mr. Siegel uh, for the invitation to be here and to talk a bit about the interest of the United States Army and the Department of Defense in regenerative medicine, including stem cells. Um, I'm not an expert on stem cells or even much of a researcher. Hopefully, I know just enough about stem cells to get through this talk. Uh, I do have Terry Ergens here, who uh, you've heard about, and, uh, and Lieutenant Colonel John Shearer is here. They, are, they run the uh, regenerative medicine portfolios, both on the advanced development and the basic science side uh, for the, uh, for really for the Department of Defense. So much of what I have to say will simply be from the perspective of a senior leader in the Army Medical Department about why what you do in your laboratories um, is so important to us. I'm going to start by uh, talking about four facts that sort of I think provide the basis for my being here today. Now, if this worked right, it was supposed to launch a video. And about now you'd hear this really out, uh, loud, obnoxious boom. So just kind of imagine the boom for me, okay? Because uh, they tell me the video is not going to work. Um, so the, the, um, one of the reasons we're here is because of the kind of enemies we fight and their adaptation of techniques that are designed to neutralize the superior technological and material advantages and the training advantages of the United States military. And so that has led to the signature weapon of the current group of conflicts, which is the improvised explosive device. Uh, improvised explosive device uh, is, uh, vi transfers very high energy over a very, very short period of time. Um, it, uh, the, the energy itself uh, has enormous uh, damage, uh, causes enormous damage to tissues, uh, but then it also produces shrapnel and in some instances and in some circumstances burns that uh, then do secondary and tertiary effects to soldiers, whether they be dismounted soldiers uh, uh, ground uh, on the ground or whether they be uh, soldiers in uh, our war fighting platforms or vehicles. Uh, uh, IEDs produce multiple wounds. Uh, they are uh, dirty wounds that are uh, prone to acute and chronic infections. They're large wounds volume loss of muscle, bone, nerve, and vascular tissue. And they are horrible, disfiguring, and disabling wounds. And so that constitutes the first of the four facts why regenerative medicine uh, matters a great deal to us. The second fact is um, that in spite of how these, these, these very uh, difficult to deal with weapons 
Uh, many soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines survive these attacks. And they survive in no small measure due to the uh, way they're equipped. And this is a, a picture of a U.S. Army soldier with all the kit designed to give him the best chance of survival. He's uh, got the latest in body armor with groin protection and extra enhancements in the axillary and deltoid areas to prevent sort of that sideways entry into the thorax. And we very seldom lose a soldier due to a, an isolated uh, projectile injury in the thorax or abdomen anymore as a result of the use of body armor. Uh, he's got the advanced combat helmet which is uh, generally impenetrable to all except the highest uh, velocity and highest caliber uh, weapons. And he has eye armor that, project, that pro is very effective at protecting his eyes and preserving his eyesight. And besides that, they enable soldiers to do what soldiers throughout history have wanted to do, and that is look really cool. Um, the body armor and the enhancements are only part of the story. We also, since the start of the conflict and since the and in adaptation to the enemy's extensive use of IEDs, we've had major advances in building vehicles. And that includes the mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicles and the new striker uh, vehicles that have a double V-haul that uh, channel blast energy away from the compartment that houses the people in the striker vehicle. That will become important later on. So the, the, the use of the IEDs is the first of the four points to keep in mind. The fact that in spite of how effective these weapons are and how extensive the destruction can be, um, because uh, in no small measure because of the way we've we equip the young men and women who go to Iraq and Afghanistan and other places around the world uh, that, that in uh, a lot of instances these uh, injuries are potentially survivable. And of course I'm an army doctor and so the, the, the basic unit of power in the army medical department is this young army medic. And so uh, we can't uh, and, and the way we now train Army medics becomes then the third important factor in why we're here because having that soldier equipped uh, as he was in the last picture only goes so far. The extremities are still very exposed and the extremities have major blood vessels and so the, 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 the major way soldiers die on the battlefield remains that we can do something about remains hemorrhage. And so for the last 15 to 20 years, we have been preparing this young combat medic, 68 Whiskey is the military occupational specialty that he or she goes by. We have been preparing them to deal more effectively with those things that, that you can do something about that kill soldiers on the battlefield. It's the transformation of the, of the second largest military occupational specialty in the Army. The three things that soldiers die from on the battlefield that, that are potentially preventable are tension pneumothorax, upper airway obstruction, and hemorrhage. And hemorrhage uh, outweighs the others uh, by a several fold. And so the, this, that 68 whiskey, not just the 68 whiskey, but every soldier is carrying a combat application tourniquet. And we have seen those save many, many, many lives throughout this conflict. And we have other hemo, uh, compressive devices that uh, have been developed over the course of the conflicts, and we've done a lot of work with both topical and systemic hemostatic agents. So that IEDs, the, the uh, body armor, and then the combat medic. And I'll get to the fourth thing that I, the fourth uh, fundamental fact that is why we're here. So, so what we have is, uh, is a very low die to wounds rate. Uh, this, uh, the top part of this slide shows that in World War II there was one fatality for every wounded soldier in World War II. And here we have um, a, a die to wounds rate that is, uh, that is underneath uh, 10 percent. 
Uh, so we have nine wounded for every fatality. And some of them uh, have wounds that in previous conflicts they would never have survived. But they are horrible wounds. Again, these are, they have lost, uh, they've lost limbs. Sometimes they have, uh, they have uh, limb salvage, but they have lost massive amounts of soft tissue. They have a bone that will be very hard to um, that, uh, make for a, a usable limb. And in some instances, we uh, salvage the limb, and, and a year or so later, the soldier or the Marine will come back and say, you know, it's really not good for very much, and I think I could rehabilitate and be a lot better if we went ahead and did an amputation. And that's happening less now for a variety of reasons that aren't the subject of this talk. But that's, uh, so those are, the, those are the young men and women that we are taking care of it with the Walter Reeds and the Bethesdas and the Balboas and the Brook Army Medical Centers of the world. Um, and the conventional or traditional or normal or whatever the medical techniques of taking care of these injuries simply do not suffice. They just haven't been enough. And so um, we have had to look outside of our usual comfort zone, which is kind of fairly orthodox medicine, to people like you to help us try to solve these problems. Uh, and uh, the rest of this talk is then to, um, to talk a little bit about how we're organized and how we do that and some of the things that we have going on. I would introduce here the fourth of the facts, and that is uh, what we learned in a very painful way uh, via the Washington Post and Walter Reed in 2007. And that was that the American people would not settle for conventional thinking. That for the young men and women who wear the nation's cloth and go to places like Iraq and Afghanistan and are exposed to improvised explosive devices that have wives and children that wait on them, and then when they're hurt, they go to our military treatment facilities and they hang in there for sometimes years as they're getting treated and rehabilitated. That America did not expect that we would be short-sighted or we would shortchange what we could offer them in any way, shape, or form. And so we had to, for one of the few times, uh, look really outside our own area of expertise. And, and we did uh, what we found uh, among, sometimes in people who are probably in this room, and certainly in, uh, across the country, we found a lot of people who said that they were willing to help. And so the rest of the talk is really about uh, that part of the story. Uh, we we like doing gap analyses. That's in the military, you get really good at doing gap analyses. And if you work in the federal government, doing gap analyses. And so when you look back at the first two or three years of conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan, this is these were the gaps, and these are uh, th these are fairly broad areas. Obviously, treatment of extremity injury, uh, pain management remains an issue. Uh, rehabilitation, and we think pain management may re relate uh, somewhat to uh, one of our big problems, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. And so um, we think more effective pain management early on may decrease the likelihood of post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's very, very important to us. Rehabilitation of neuromuscular injuries. Before these conflicts, we really didn't know very much about rehabilitation medicine. We relied extensively on the Veterans Health Administration to do that for us. We have had to learn a great deal about rehabilitation medicine in a very short period of time. Craniofacial injuries, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the really tough patients we've taken care of have lost parts of their face, and that's very, very difficult for them to deal with and very, very difficult problem to treat. Uh, burns and scars, uh, there's a very good news story here in that the number of uh, patients severely burned as a result of a conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan has dramatically declined over the years as we've improved the fire resistance of the clothing that they wear and as we've, uh, we've continued to work on fire suppression systems inside their vehicles. Um, visual system regeneration, we don't have lots and lots of people been blinded uh, by uh, as a result of Iraq and Afghanistan and um, especially when they wear that eye armor that I showed you before. Uh, or, orthotics, prosthetics, and robotics. Uh, orthotics, I think, is probably the newest area where we have a tremendous amount of focus and we're having to do a lot fewer 
of the delayed amputations in part because of some of the successes with our orthotics. Uh, besides treatment of visual loss, uh, rehabilitation of visual loss is something we uh, rely extensively on others. Uh, auditory system regeneration, we have blown out a lot of eardrums in Iraq and Afghanistan, as you might imagine, from those uh, IEDs. And certainly then treatment of traumatic brain injury. And uh, regenerative medicine uh, technologies have something to offer many, many, and many, and many of these area, these gaps that we have uh, yet to fill. This is kind of the current funding profile, and uh, I'll tell you that um, that's probably going to change. As a matter of fact, it has changed already. Uh, many of you are aware. I, I suspect some of you have dealt with uh, medical research and materiel command. Uh, I won't ask for a show of hands, but um, I think that either in the, the TATRIC area or as part of a firm, uh, you perhaps are involved. Some of you may have been involved in DARPA projects. But these are the three big areas, and I'm not an expert on DARPA, and I don't know whether they're represented at this meeting, but yeah, DARPA is really focused on quantum leaps. They are really look at, at transformative technologies. Uh, they, uh, they are willing to, uh, in a, uh, a high-stakes poker game, uh, they play for really high stakes, uh, and, uh, they, uh, and when they have something that pay off, uh, then there's a chance that it's going to uh, pay big dividends for all of us. Uh, on the other side of this slide at the Medical Research and Materiel Command, we are driven by requirements which relate to those gaps that you saw on the previous slide. We have a tendency to make smaller investments. We're probably not out there uh, quite as far sometimes looking as far into the future as the DARPA folks are. And then in the middle we have the, the TATRIC and the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program. These tend to be fairly small awards. Uh, they are, uh, usually have a congressional sponsor. Usually the congressional sponsor has an intended recipient or at least a zip code where the, where the, the, the money is supposed to go. Uh, and again, tend to be fairly small investments, but sometimes uh, when accumulated over years, you can put together a, a pretty good research program. But uh, as you're aware, uh, for FY 2011, there are, no, uh, there are no real earmarks in that area. And so the, the, the incubator function, the, the relatively small investments, many of which would not pay off, but some of which might then go into the core funding or, or even evolve into DARPA programs, we can't support nearly as many as, of those as we have in the past. Uh, at TATRIC right now, we have a total of 79 uh, projects. Uh, they're all relatively small, uh, very, uh, very few over a couple million dollars, uh, but we do have 60 uh, patents filed or issued um, as, a result of, uh, as a result of the efforts in, in TATRIC. Now, on the right side is, or the, it's, yeah, I guess you're looking at it, it's the right side is the requirements driven research area director, the, the core funds. That is the Armed Forces Institute of Regenerative Medicine Program, $100 million investment over five years. And, and Mr. Siegel referred to that earlier. And to some of you in this room, $100 million over five years sounds like a lot of money. And to some of the rest of you in this room, $100 million over five years doesn't sound like all that much money. I, I understand that. For us, it's a lot of money. And for us to get that kind of money to launch a program in 2008, rather than having to start off small and build up as we went along, was really quite an accomplishment. Um, uh, if you, and, and some would say, well, if taking care of these kids hurt in Iraq and Afghanistan is such a big deal, General Gilman, how come there's not more money there? Or how come it's not growing faster? And, and I don't have a really good answer for you, but I, I, I would say that, that the amount of money in any uh, medical R&D program is always balanced with the research and development done in other areas of uh, the Department of Defense. And so uh, if I had, uh, have money to invest, I have, a, have to make a decision about trying to push uh, regenerative medicine technologies further down the road, or I have to make a decision about doing research and development on the equipment that soldier wears or on the vehicles that they're operating in, um, which might enable me to prevent some of these horrific injuries. I, I would just tell you that, that, that there are a lot of people inside the building that struggle with those decisions. From my perspective, they don't always get them just exactly right, but I've yet to find any of them weren't trying their best 
to understand what we do so that uh, they could help us, but uh, especially in our current uh, fiscal environment, there are going to be some very, very hard choices made. We have asked for, uh, instead of $20 million going forward for a firm two, we have asked for $35 million a year in the President's budget. We'll see whether we get uh, that or not. The mission of Regenerative Medicine at Medical Research and Material Command is to discover, develop, and translate regenerative medicine technologies having both near and far-term translation potential. And like you, I, w I was just, you know, amazed at, at uh, Dr. Janich's uh, presentation. But I will tell you that the people that I work for that are responsible for that $20 million a year or that $35 million a year we've asked for, for helping us advocate for that amount of money, they're not terribly excited about those presentations. What they want to see is technologies that can be used for soldiers. They are interested in things that we can get to the FDA and we can actually get out and use to, to solve some of these problems. By their own description, they are not patient people. Uh, they, they do love soldiers and Marines and their families and they are absolutely committed to, uh, to pushing us along at every opportunity. But they, they, they don't care, uh, they, they, they don't, they're not motivated by scientific awards and prizes. They're not motivated by large uh, infrastructure that, you know, to address these complex problems. They are motivated by things that can help soldiers and their family members and Marines and their family members soon. And so uh, we always keep that in mind at the Medical Research and Material Command, whether it be a firm or one of the other programs. And we're trying to find, uh, we're trying to find some things that we can actually get through full FDA approval. Um, and I'll talk to you about one or two of those in just a minute. The second mission is to provide cutting edge medical capabilities to heal and reset our warriors who have catastrophic traumatic injuries and, and disabilities. Our market potential for our patient population, uh, for those of you that, are, that think about the business of, of regenerative medicine, is probably modest. Um, compared to diabetes, heart disease, dementia, degenerative joint disease, and some of the other things that have been talked about in this conference or will be talked about, we simply have a very important patient population. And that's what we found out at Walter Reed and, and via the Washington Post in 2007. In March 2008, the U.S. Army Medical Research and Material Command, in partnership with the Navy, Air Force, Veterans Health Administration, and National Institutes of Health, established the Armed Forces Institute for Regenerative Medicine with $100 million total funding. The strategy to use combination investment, assemble a group of the best scientists in the field to rapidly translate regenerative medicine capabilities to our wounded warriors was at the core of that effort. The success of this program has attracted additional funding from Defense Health Program and the Joint Improvised Explosive Device Defeat Organization, partnering with the Department of Defense's Office of Technology Transition. Uh, so we got an additional $25 million from them. Many of the partners in a firm brought their own skin to the game, and so that er a firm currently has an investment of over $300 million because of matching funds from state governments universities, philanthropic organizations, and pre-existing research projects related to the AFFIRM mission. Many of these projects have funding from the National Institutes of Health, the Defense Health Program, or the National Science Foundation, and congressional ads. Moving forward, we have requested $35 million per year over the next five years. That, um, I, there's been a lot talked about uh, multidisciplinary work, and this is just uh, our uh, fancy word for multidisciplinary work uh, are convergent science, and we're not going to dwell on this slide very much. For us, it's not about stem cells. It's not about transplants. It's not about tissue engineering. It's about regeneration. It's about, it's about what combination of those things give the young men and women who have, uh, who have uh, gone into harm's way and been injured severely at what give them the best uh, functional and uh, anatomic results. Uh, the scientists performing the work we funded are using different approaches for regenerative therapies. 
They use bioreactors, growth factors, scaffolds, devices, and cells, including stem cells, to tackle the task. They are developing novel immunomodulation therapies for tissue cell uh, transplantation. And again, it's not about stem cells per se. It's about regeneration of structure and function by whatever means. The uh, picture at the top left shows the scaffold approach. The middle, uh, middle left shows adult stem cells, and the bottom shows an ear mold, which can be coated with cells. The right top is our chimeric rat with induced immunity to the donor tissue. The middle is, uh, it represents curcumin spice, which found in Indian curry for burn and scar treatment. And the bottom is then uh, represent, the picture represents a bioactive material. This is a partnership. We have industry partners. We have joint partners in the other services. We have interagency partners. We have partners with academic institutes. And I've already alluded to the commercial partners. Uh, sometimes we have so many partners, I think we're being promiscuous. But, uh, but we prefer the word ubiquitous. Uh, translational research is a team effort. We can share our expertise in product development, marketing, regulatory affairs, and manufacturing. We can share resources for clinical trials. And uh, we can work together to license technologies and seek the additional financial investment it'll take to get these into the marketplace. Studies focus on questions of interest to the military, but most of the products have commercial application. They provide a mechanism to advance combat casualty care, and as I've said, advances improve both civilian and military care. Based on the affirmed business model, we currently have 72 projects still in the science and technology arena, and 12 products in advanced development. Of those 84 projects, we will have to call the herd, a process that we call down selection. Certainly not all of those advanced pro uh, not all projects will make it to human trials. The down selection or culling the herd will be via animal model testing for safety and functional animal model testing for efficacy to select the best products to transition to phase one human clinical trials. Given the different FDA requirements for products to transition to phase one human clinical trials, Given the different FDA requirements for an IDE or an IND, we anticipate FDA approval of three to four products within the next three to five years. And that's really quite an accomplishment because when we started a firm uh, in 2008, the goal was to have one technology in human trials by the end of the five years for the $100 million investment. A single product in clinical trials at the end of five years we're still just a little over halfway through the program, and, right, and today we have more than 11 clinical trials underway. We have five products in a phase one clinical trial to assess safety of the product, and we have another five products in phase two clinical trial to assess safety and efficacy of the product. We have one product, Resell, from Avita Medical in a phase 2B3 trial, clinical trial. This is a pivotal efficacy trial. The trial will enroll 110 patients, and the company is hoping the successful trial will get them the FDA approval. This product is already available in a number of overseas, a number of other countries, but likely would not be approaching licensure in the U.S. without a firm's involvement. We are very uh, proud of our association with that effort. This slide depicts a number of the Affirm products and techniques that are currently in advanced development. I've already talked about Resell. Manufactured by Avita Medical, 10 clinical sites actively enrolling into comparison of split thickness mesh skin graft versus Resell for treatment of burn injuries. Just below the Resell uh, portion of the slide is a slide that talks about engineered skin, and there are two efforts here. One's called Permaderm, manufactured by Lanza, it's autologous engineered skin substitute as replacement for split thickness mesh skin grafts. 
The other product is called Stratagraft. It's manufactured by Stratatech. It's an allogeneic engineered skin substitute as replacement for split thickness mesh skin grafts. The next one is a product called Keraheal, manufactured by Keranetics. It's for use in the management of partial thickness burns and to provide temporary treatment prior to excision and grafting. The company is also assessing the appropriate clinical data necessary to support the use of Keraheal as an aid to reducing the need for tissue excision and grafting by suppressing damage to tissues peripheral to the burn. They've had a successful pre-IDE meeting with the FDA. Middle portion of the slide represents the effort in tissue regeneration and transplantation. Extracellular matrix, work by Drs. Badalak at the University of Pittsburgh and Dr. Wolf, Steve Wolf at the U.S. Army Institute for Surgical Research for treatment of volumetric muscle loss. It's an off-the-shelf biologic scaffold for functional muscle tissue restoration. And it's in a, a, still in a 1B clinical trial. Uh, there are a number of efforts in uh, neural regeneration and neural defect repair, a study of novel scaffold biomaterial to regenerate neural pathways. That protocol is currently in IRB review. There are two additional products, one from Keragen, uh, also called Neuralum. Uh, both target repair of critical size peripheral nerve defects with biodegradable bioactive conduits. Uh, Keragen is a keratin-based biomaterial from the company Keranetics. Neuralum is a polycaprolactone fumarate biomaterial from from the company uh, Bon WRX. They need a, another vowel in there. Um, we have funded hand transplantation, uh, currently enrolling patients at the University of Pittsburgh. It's an immunomodulatory modulatory strategy named the Pittsburgh Protocol, which may, um, may reduce uh, immunosuppressive therapy requirements. Again, the, the folks that are getting the, the transplants in these cases are in their 20s. They're going to have this graph for a very, very long period of time, and decreasing the diseases associated with transplantation is very, very important. Um, Emory University also recently uh, announced a successful hand transplant, which was also funded by the Department of Defense. Uh, I won't go into detail about the uh, face transplant studies, but uh, we're currently enrolling patients uh, still at the Cleveland Clinic, the site of the first successful face transplant in the U.S. in 2009. Uh, there are two separate efforts. One is uh, Dr. Maria Simeonov, at, uh, who was, is a, an affirm investigator, is currently enrolling patients at the Cleveland Clinic. And then uh, there's an effort at the Brigham and Women's University uh, and that is funded by a different DOD program. But uh, one of the things that we do at uh, the Medi U.S. Army's Medical Research and Material Command is coordinate across all the programs in DOD uh, pretty effectively. For those that uh, have already undergone their, their uh, burn treatment, uh, burn tr uh, recovery, uh, and also for some of the more horrific uh, uh, surface wounds, uh, we have a neodyne bandage uh, manufactured by Neodyne Biosciences, which is intended to improve aesthetic and functional outcome. And the first site of a multi-site study is expected to begin uh, began this year. It's a phase two uh, clinical trial. These are some other promising AFIRM products on the horizon. Uh, the skin bioprinter is a device to repair burn and scarring. Uh, a skin stretching device uh, for burn repair. Uh, we have uh, a product to develop that, that results in improvement of the development of innervated vascularized skeletal muscle for facial reconstruction. Uh, I've already talked to, about our chimeric rat. And then uh, we have fracture resistant tissue stint graft for treatment of traumatic uh, blood vessel injury. We're going to switch out of the uh, AFIRM uh, portfolio now and go into the TATRIC portfolio uh, that cover neuroprotection and repair. We also encourage product solution from academic institutions for areas that are more challenging and will take more time to solve. Spinal cord regeneration remains the most challenging problem in regenerative medicine. To realize the local delivery of drugs and stem cells, appropriate scaffold materials are needed. Here, uh, Dr. Song Lee from the University of California, Berkeley, loses na uses nanofibrous patch to deliver a small molecule to treat acute spinal cord injury. 
Following hemisection injury, nanofibrous patch was placed on the surface of spinal cord as a dural substitute. The nanofibers on the luminal surface of the patch aligned in the longitudinal direction to guide axon growth, and the drug was delivered from the nanofibrous patch. The drug rolopram is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor and could suppress inflammatory responses and promote axon growth. The investigator found that axons grew across the patch along the nanofibers, but not so much in the lesion region, suggesting that the nanofibrous patch could serve as a scaffold for spinal cord regeneration. In addition, rolopram significantly improved the functional recovery of the limb. Another research challenge is to regenerate severed nerve of critical defect size. Nerve conduits have been used to bridge the gap of injured nerves. However, the regeneration of nerve is usually so slow, and nerves cannot regenerate if the gap is over three centimeters. Again, Dr. Lee combines the nanofibrous conduit and stem cells to promote and accelerate nerve regeneration. The bilayer nerve conduits with nanofibers aligned in the longitudinal direction was developed to facilitate axon growth. Uh, we have separate programs in vision and uh, hearing repair, uh, and we highlight here the, re the efforts of Dr. Gregory Schultz at the University of Florida and Dr. Uh, Lee at uh, uh, the Baylor College and Dr. Barbet at Sorrentis uh, Ophthalmics uh, these have to do with, um, uh, three of the projects have to do with the regeneration of cornea, and uh, then one has to do with the uh, uh, treatment of acute uh, sound-induced hearing loss. In the congressionally directed medical research program, uh, we have uh, projects to promote uh, cartilage stem cell activity to improve. Uh, this one, uh, perhaps has a very a widespread application, and this is uh, the work of Dr. Dr. Tojichi, Tojiki at the University of Iowa. And then we have another product, uh, project by Dr. Yang at the University of Texas at Houston. To determine if fracture-related chemotactic factors induce migratory activity in chondrocytes and cells from other joint tissues, identify effective biological adjunct therapy to prevent or mitigate early cartilage changes that contribute to development of post-traumatic arthritis. These are the uh, different research programs in the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program. Um, Congress gives us the money and tells us the disease process. Uh, we design the research, we design a research strategy, we, and then we conduct the competitive awards. Uh, this is not specifically focused on stem cell or regenerative medicine, but there is nothing about these programs that precludes stem cell work and regenerative medicine work from competing for the pots of money in here. Just because you're not an investigator in a firm doesn't mean you can't compete uh, for uh, funding through the U.S. Army Medical Research and Material Command. So how can the Department of Defense academia, academia and Industry partner? You can apply for DOD funding through either broad agency announcements and program announcements. You can pr promote communication. We promote communication of market feedback and commercialization knowledge to help guide early product development. We engage the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to identify cl and clarify pathways for regenerative medicine products. And we engage U.S. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to identify reimbursement for regenerative medicine products. Establishing commercial partners is essential to the long-term success of our regenerative medicine efforts. Without these types of partnerships, we will not be able to effectively solve the problems of face wounded warriors. DOD funding can sometimes de-risk research and development and accelerate promising militarily relevant technologies. Although we may fund all levels of research and development, the programs tend to focus funding up to clinical phase one or phase two trials, establishing early human safety and efficacy data. There are broad area announcement and program announcements that are the, the mechanisms that are used to provide both military and congressionally directed financial support. We look forward to working together to engage the Food and Drug Administration and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services to work through the complications associated with the regulatory and reimbursement challenges that regenerative medicine provides. Here are all of the websites. I presume that these uh, will be made available on, on a conference website at some point uh, or other. Um, I, I again want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. I hope that you understand why the work that 
is performed by all the people in this room and many who are not here today is so important to us. Uh, we have uh, a number of people who have been severely injured uh, and uh, the usual ways of taking care of combat casualty uh, wounds uh, simply has not provided enough of the answers for how we get them back to, uh, to an active life and uh, full function. Um, it, it is never about a, a particular technology. It's not, never about publishing a lot of papers. It's never about winning prizes. It's never about having people that have, are doing things that make our uh, CVs longer. It is always about the people who are represented on this slide. Um, it has uh, been my honor to be here today. It's been my honor to take care of these men and women or to oversee their care for my entire uh, professional career. Your help in, uh, in addressing their needs uh, both now and in the future is much appreciated. Thank you.